Best of r slash tales from tech support episode 59. So for a long while I was a cellular switch technician. I worked for a small company so the title was superfluous to my job since I did everything involved with cellular. One of my duties was being the on-call tech in rotation. Usually every three weeks since we had three techs. So, after hours we had a service take calls and either direct customers to call during working hours or take a detailed message for us the next day. The calls however, were to our 800 number so it was rarely a tech issue. Lots of my phone has no service or my bill is wrong calls. So on to the story. The company decided that we only needed techs on call to fix system issues as they arise. Customer service was only during business hours. Customers, however, often decide that 2 a.m. is the best time to call and complain about their phone service and rapidly realized that saying no signal got an actual call back rather than a polite someone will call you tomorrow. Now, where I am at, on call isn't paid unless you are called. At that time, you get 2 hours minimum. If you get called at 1, 2 hours, you get called at 2, same 2 hours. But if you get called at 3.05, another 2 hours. Now techs were the highest paid employees barring management, and I was the highest of the techs. Also, should a call come in before midnight after my 8 hour day, it was overtime pay. So, I mentioned that a lot of my calls were not system issues and that we might consider a CS rotation as well. Of course, since the service was filtering a lot at that time it was decided we could suck it up. We checked the system for alarms. Make sure nothing was on fire, maybe run a backup or some reports to save time in the morning and try to not take 2 hours for 10 minutes work. Then the service changed and we started getting calls. A lot more calls. Well, I kept doing my job as ordered. I think one night I got 6 hours OT and 4 hours of my day shift before I even went into work. I was making bank for about 2 months until management got around to checking payroll. I was called in to ask why I was overcharging hours. I pointed out that my cost was higher but the hours matched the other two techs. Kids had an awesome Christmas that year if I recall correctly. CS went into on-call rotation the next week and I never got woken up by a pager to hear a drunk person say they had no service. Thank you. Next. Hi. This is my first post here ever but I'm gonna do my best. Back in 2010 I was working as tech support for a large company with multiple facilities around the country. One day my co-worker that was responsible for the servers in every facility, I know it's stupid, he was working way too much already, freaked out and told me to check if I could reach any of the servers or even switches at one of the facilities. As it turned out and by the look of his face already, I could tell that he didn't expect much but then freaked out even more. A few minutes later people from that facility begin to spam call me since I was the only one in the support team working at that time asking why their internet didn't and why nothing is working regarding any network attached tech overall. My reply was that my co-worker will be there in a few hours and there is nothing we can do from here. My co-worker drove still freaking out for something like 7 hours straight to get to that facility. He met a lady that worked there and she showed him where the servers were located. When they got there he saw that the door was slightly open and that some power cord were coming out from the server room. He stopped and asked what that was for and that the room should be shut at all times to not mess with the temperature. She told him to follow her and they walked into the room that was blazing hot. Here comes the best part slash worst of this entire story. This lady that was supposed to change the backup tapes for the servers thought it was too cold in the server room so she went out and bought an industrial heater fan. I don't know if that is the correct term, but it was large, and was spitting out heat into the server room. The poor AC that was set to a temperature while he lower than what that thing managed to produce began to work harder, then the fan worked harder to keep its temperature. After a while the power for the entire room just died and all servers ran on battery backup for a few hours until they died. He asked her why in heck she would do that, and her reply was something like, It's my job to change the backup tapes every morning and I always thought it was too cold in there so I put a fan there so I won't become sick. When my co-worker came back and told my boss what had happened I had to leave the room because I didn't want to laugh my ass off in front of my boss and since I was an awkward kid back then I didn't want to give them a bad impression. Thanks for me. Thank you. Next. Suu among the literally thousands of calls I've had in my 4 years in tech support for an ISP. This guy really took the cake. 
It was the apotheosis of all those calls. It was the most infuriating yet, in hindsight, hilarious call I'd ever had in my life. He came in on a fairly quiet Saturday morning, and the conversation started quite normally. Me, good morning, this is, name, from, ISP, how may I help you? C, customer, yes, hello, this is, his name. I just woke up to my wife and kids complaining there's no internet and the television isn't working either. Me, oof, that's quite inconvenient. I'm going to have to check where the issue might be and try and fix it. C, thank you. He gave me his postal code and house number. I confirmed his details and ran a scan on his address. There was absolutely no signal. So I needed to do a basic troubleshoot with him. First, me, do you know where your modem is, sir? C. Yes, it's next to my front door. Me. Good. Could you please tell me which lights are on or blinking on it? C. There are a couple of lights on. Not as many as usual, though. Me. Is the online light on? C. No. Me. Okay. Your modem is not receiving any signal. Then. I'm going to have to test if the problem is in the modem or the signal towards your house. For that. I need you to turn off your modem for about 30 seconds. Could you please do that? C. Um, no. Me. I'm sorry. C. That sort of thing is your job. I'm not touching that modem. Me. You only need to pull out the power cable, wait 30 seconds, and plug it back in. C. Like I said, that's your job. Send someone over to fix it. I was not sure if he was joking or not. I was just baffled at the hard turn this conversation had just taken. Me, sir, there is a basic troubleshoot we need to run with all our customers that solves like 90% of all. C, I don't care. I'm not getting paid for this, so I'm not doing your job. Now send someone over. Me, I can't very well send our technicians over, just to plug out your modem, sir. C, you can, and you will. And you'll compensate me for the time I haven't received any of your services. Me. I don't care much for your tone, sir. Either you cooperate with our standard troubleshoot, or I cannot help you. C. You've got a pretty big mouth there, missy. What's your name? I'll issue a complaint against you. Me. My name is. First name, sir. C. First name. What? Me. Just. First name, sir. C. Scared to give me your last name, hum? Me. No, just not obligated to give it to you. You've been very rude to me, so I won't give it to you. C. You think you're so high and mighty because you're on the phone. I know where your HQ is. I'm driving over there right now and you'd better make sure you have your eyes open when you come out. My first name in a mocking tone. I snickered at the thought. He lived about 280 kilometers. 175 miles from our HQ. Plus, he only had my first name and he had, of course, no idea what I looked like. Me, if you would rather take 3 hours to get here and then another 3 to get back home, rather than taking 30 seconds to restart your modem, you're welcome to do so. I'm now terminating the call and issuing a threat warning. Have a lovely day. I hung up before he could respond and reported a threat of violence to my manager. He made note of it and put it through to our second line to pick this further up. I wish I could say the story ended there, but unfortunately, it continued as soon and I resumed taking calls. Not five minutes after I got back to work, I got him on the phone again. Me. Good morning. This is. Name. From. C. H. A. There you are. You think you can just hang up on me? I'm taking this to court. I'm cancelling our services as of right now. Me. I've issued your violent threat, which we've recorded, by the way, to our second line, sir. I'll add that you wish to terminate your contract. They'll call you back within two hours. Goodbye. I hung up again and he thankfully didn't try to reach me again after that. I did learn afterwards that he had, in fact, taken this case to court, and lost. His services were cancelled five months before the end date of the contract, and he had to pay up the remaining five months. I hope it was worth it to him. I did not press charges for the threat, since I never took it seriously. I mean, I literally laughed it off. Thinking back of it still makes me snicker. I'm imagining him driving for 3 hours, arriving at our HQ, 
asking all the women who left the building their names in the hopes he could do god knows what to one of them, then driving back home for 3 hours, not to mention having to stop for gas, which costs a lot here, and still have his wife and children complaining they have no internet or television. Idiot. Thank you. Next. I'm currently sitting in a TV truck at a certain winter sporting event in Colorado. We communicate back to the network via IP phone lines, assigned to this and set up by said TV network, dialing into a coordination bridge. For the last three days, including this afternoon, it has worked perfectly. Until tonight, no matter what we tried we could no longer dial out to the bridge or to any number for that matter. The TV truck engineers and I are pretty good at laying in and checking infrastructure. We made sure that the dial tone was getting to us, and that our equipment worked. However at the end of our troubleshooting, we hit a wall. Time to call in the big guns. The nameless network engineer Ray traced our troubleshooting confirming that hardware wise, we were all good. Time to log in and check the system. Well, from the overheard conversation including some laughter, it appears that our dids, I think I heard that term right, were double booked and assigned to another upcoming major sporting event in Miami, thus leaving us with no phones for our event tonight and tomorrow, with a quick few taps on a keyboard, we were assigned new numbers and are set to go as soon as the current event on the network ends, thank you, next, a while back, very much underpaid for this, I took a contract managing the printer network services for a large governmental structure with about 1200 printer devices on a Citrix based network. My job was software related to their print server and software slash hardware related to the printer itself as well as some base resource management. Essentially I also just took on the role of making sure the auto order system for printer supplies would go through. It seems like such a narrow scope but there was enough to do of basically just making sure printers showed us online in AD at the end of the day. I would walk around a lot as making sure when printers would get swap locations taking care of the max swap, if needed, checking for punched dropped, occasionally toning a line, confirming the auto order location, etc. So I got a reputation for just being called the printer guy. I would help out with jams and swapping toner if I wasn't too busy but it wasn't really part of my job. Mechanical failures would have a CSE dispatched from the printer company with a 24 hour fix or escalation clause. Q one of the men of Karen's I would run into here. Karen worked in the DMV who obviously need printers and need them functioning at all times. I'm unfortunately working in the country jail at the moment which means my phone is in lockup. I get my phone back an hour or so later and notice about 10 missed calls w slash no voicemail. I call the service desk. Me. Hi this is Rick Turrell I got a bunch of missed calls I was in the jail working. Do you know what's up? Service desk. Karen at the DMV at X location is claiming all her printers are broken. They're showing fine in 80 though. You think you can take a look? Me yeah sure. Give me like 15 minutes to find some decent Wi-Fi and I'll boot my laptop up and see if there's an issue on the server or whatnot. Do you have her number so I can verify a couple of things if needed? About 5 minutes after that I get a call on my cell phone. A very irate voice. Hi is this the printer guy? Me. Yes. Is this Karen? I just. Karen. Oh so you do know about my problem. I cannot print. This is unacceptable. Me. I under. Karen. Stop talking and listen. Me. Karen. Are you there? Me. Karen. You asked me to listen? Karen goes on to explain basically nothing beyond they can't print. But I find from her it's actually only one printer that's down and she gives me the error code of it which I'm familiar with as a mechanical fault error. Me. Okay I'm going to forward all the print jobs to the other printers in the area and contact printer company to have them come out and take a look they're pretty good about a 24 hour response time. Karen, that's unacceptable, you need to come to fix this now. I then spend 20 minutes going back and forth with her how I don't have the tool slash parts to really fix most mechanical issues. I just do it if I'm not having a busy day like I am right now. But I gave up arguing with her cause I realize there's actually a really good lunch spot in that area where she's located. So figure fuck it, I'll get me some delicious lunch and I'll get out of the downtown city for a bit. Get there, sure enough. It's a mechanical failure indicating needing parts that again I don't carry. Karen. Well I'm going to have my call forwarded to sell every 20 minutes until this fixed. Me. 
So good news my phone has a block function. Karen, you can't block me. Me, you're not a critical employee that I need to answer my phone out of hours for so. Have a good day. Thank you. Next. Part 1. Part 2. Part 3. Part 4. Part 5. Part 6. TL. Doctor I'm the person who asks inconvenient questions in the middle of a complicated movie where everyone is a diehard fan. I'm somewhere between why is Captain Kirk talking funny, in the middle of Incubus and the weirding module wasn't in the books in a extended director's cut of Lynch's Dune. I'm also about to get yelled at by my boss for it. I thumb to she, my boss, me, hi there, is this an offer to roll off this project? She, can you just keep your hair down for a day? It seems my air cover is going away. I'm going to be beaten up on both sides. For a minute I consider going back to something less confrontational, like litigation. Me, she, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be a pain in the ass. I was just asking the simple questions and the answers I got were horribly wrong. If a cop pulls over a car for a traffic infraction and notices that all four occupants are covered in blood, they kinda have asked some follow-up questions. Maybe it's innocent, like they're coming back from a gua show. Maybe they're sprinkling. She, and they're covered in blood. Me, sort of. They're immature and they're expecting a seamless migration. She, every rollout has friction. What you're doing is causing concern at the client and that's not a good look for you. Me, I understand. I disagree about friction. This isn't friction. Their ops team is pulling all nighters patching stuff by hand. They're going to make a mistake. That's bad. No backups means no safety net and rollbacks are hard. An organization that runs like that doesn't know what they have, much less write it down somewhere. Their infra falls over, it stays over. That's not a good look for us. She goes silent for almost a minute. She, okay, so what do we do? Me, we need to ask to push the cut over. We need to ensure we have a solid, up-to-date set of their business state so that transactions process in case this goes badly. It's safer that way. She, write that up. While I'm preparing a formal, measured response, my email is like a nature documentary of rival and colonies, separated by acts and set to host Smars, the bringer of war. Backup team, backups are fine, they're just taking too long and that's wasting time we don't have backup team, we don't think there's a problem. We're trying another arbitrary file to prove that it all works VP of IT, I'm sure the backup team has everything in hand. Explain in detail why you're wasting their time me. Backups are like fire extinguishers you only think about them when there's a fire. So you check them before you try something that risks burning down your house. Like teaching your kids how to breathe fire in the house. VP of IT. We're not paying for jokes. She. We have a plan to ensure success. Which we'd like to show you. Lot of she will be quiet. VP of IT. Client legal and a few other people. We are concerned that you're developing a plan without our input. Client offshore team, succinctly put, the backups are balked and, with footnotes, not the offshore team's fault meeting invites, pre-meeting invites, agendas and who needs to be on this call email chains float above me like Tetris pieces as I grind out this plan over next day. Maybe this is what air cover looks like. Bad hotel coffee and flop sweet keep me going for the process. I've got to prep a project plan for the client. In addition, an exec summary about the nature of the problem, a slide deck, a selection of potential questions and their responses. The plan is cumbersome, a few hours. That's center she, she's boss and the managing director. Exposure to senior management during a crisis is good, unless you're the one who caused the crisis. This would be an excellent time for a cliffhanger. She and she's boss have opinions on the plan. She believes that my plan needs more details. They'd like to see actual tasks with time estimates for each task that roll up to milestones and sample validation procedures for testing backups. She's boss calls me about 18 hours in as I'm about to step in the shower. She's boss, this is going in the wrong direction. The plan needs fewer details. Also the validation procedures are too detailed for senior management. Me, the procedures aren't for senior management. They're for the techs. She's boss, this should be higher level. Executives don't want to read all this. Me, isn't that what the executive summary is for? She's boss, 
Everything in this is for senior management to read. I don't care what the final procedures look like. I just want the ones the execs see to be simpler. Instead of taking a desperately needed shower, I'm writing a bunch of procedures designed to never be followed because I raised the wrong questions. This makes me flash back to 7th grade when I had to write I will not do my math homework in base 4 in my notebook over and over again. I finish the documents, including a high level exec summary, one set of procedures for management to look over, another set to actually follow, a presentation and sample Q&A. I shower and get a not a lot of sleep before the flood of meetings. Meetings happen. She, she's boss and our managing director remind me of the importance of many things, including using better judgment, not asking difficult questions and the importance of customer impressions. During all this, I notice that there's one meeting I'm not invited to the one with the client bigwigs explaining what went wrong and what we're going to do about it. All my work was to prepare someone else. The emails drop off as I realize I'm no longer on most threads. I pack up my stuff, throw my bags in my rental car and drive to the client site. On the way, I call Thomas, one of the project managers I have a passing acquaintance with. Me, Thomas can you meet me in the lobby in a bit? I need to give you some equipment. Thomas, UHH, sure. What the hell did you do this week? Me, too much, it seems. I leave the rental right in front of the lobby, see Thomas and walk over to him. I hand him my client badge, work badge and laptop and take a selfie with him. We nod to each other and I hop back in my rental car. I text she with the selfie I took with my gear and Thomas. Turn my phone off and drive to the airport. Both good and evil are punished and I'm neither sure which one I am or who cries the loudest. Thank you. Next. I'm not in tech support, but have wanted to tell this story for a long time but had nowhere of posting it. So here goes. A few years ago I was working in credit control for a global courier company in the UK. We had some standard template letters that were needed to reply to queries on customers invoices. I cannot remember now what the letter was I needed to write. But I didn't have the template. I asked my colleague who was this lovely older lady if she could email over a copy. She asked how do I do that. I was about to walk over and show when her friend sitting next to her. Karen actually called Karen said she'd show her. No worries I thought and waited. A few minutes later an email comes through. I open it up and it takes me a few seconds to realize what is wrong. She'd taken a screen print of the letter. Saved it and as an MPG or something and sent it over. I went over and asked Karen to explain what I mean by send me a copy of the letter. She replied with I've always done it that way. When I showed her how to attach the word doc to an email, she said that's what I just did. In the end I just copied and typed out the letter. The mind boggles.